Hey guys, welcome to your first video lecture of the spring semester. Today's video lecture topic is going to be the principles of ecology. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video. Remember, your notes organizer needs to be entirely complete in order to be able to use it for the homework check. So like I said, today's topic is the, are the principles of ecology, so let's start by defining ecology. Ecology is the study of the interactions between organisms with each other and between organisms and their environments. Um, within an ecosystem, within an environment, you have two types of factors. You have biotic factors and you have abiotic factors. Hopefully by now, second semester of biology, you know that the word part bio means life. So biotic factors are the living factors in an ecosystem. The abiotic factors are the non-living factors in an ecosystem. And when I say biotic factors, living factors, don't just think plants and animals. You also have fungi, bacteria, protists. Abiotic factors are going to be in everything from water to sunlight to temperature to rocks to soil. So here is a tropical rainforest ecosystem. See if you can identify maybe three abiotic factors and three biotic factors just within this picture alone. Pause if you need to. All right, we're going to talk about the different ecological levels of organization, starting with the biosphere, which is anywhere on Earth where you're going to find life. So we're talking about several kilometers above the Earth's surface and several kilometers below the ocean surface. The parts that make up the biosphere are going to be the individual organism all the way up through the biomes that come together to form the biosphere. So you have the individual organism, which comes together to form populations. Populations come together to form communities. Communities come together to form ecosystems. Ecosystems come Come together to form biomes and then the biomes together come together to form the biosphere. All right, so fill in the chart on your notes organizer. The um, terms that I have here in all caps, that's really all you need to write down for description, short and simple. Okay, so we start with our smallest level of ecological organization, which is an individual organism. So one living thing is an organism. So we're going to use a rattlesnake as an example for our organism. A population is going to be a group of organisms of the same species living within a certain area. So a single species, group of organisms living within an area. So if our individual organism was a rattlesnake, our population would be rattlesnakes. A biological community is going to be all of the interacting populations within that area. So all of the organisms, all of the living biotic factors. So if our organism was rattlesnake, our population would be rattlesnakes. And then our community would be rattlesnakes, lizards, coyote, fungi, cacti, grasses, bacteria of the Sonoran Desert. So remember, community was all of the living or biotic factors in an area. An ecosystem then is all of those living things in the community plus all of the abiotic factors. So biotic and abiotic, living and non-living. So our example of an ecosystem would be the rattlesnakes, lizards, coyotes, fungi, cacti, grasses, bacteria, and also the sunlight, sand, rocks, and temperature of the Sonoran Desert. So biotic and abiotic make up an ecosystem. Those similar little ecosystems come together to form a larger biome. So in this case, our biome would be the desert biome. Um, so they have similar climates, plants and animals. So the Sonoran along with the North American, the other North American desert ecosystems would make up the desert biome. And then all of the biomes together make up the biosphere. So pause if you need to to get some of that information. So here's another just sort of graphic showing that you have the individual organism, which would be like a caribou in this case. The population would be our caribous. The biological community would be the caribou and the moose and the mountain lions and the rabbits and the trees and the grasses and the bacteria and the fungi. And then the ecosystem would be all of those things, plus all the non-living rivers, streams, rocks, mountains. And then that would all, all of those similar ecosystems together would make a coniferous forest biome that you would find here in northern Canada. And then all of the biomes across the world together make up our biosphere everywhere you find life on Earth. <clears throat> so how do we classify biomes? What makes a biome? What is the difference between a desert and a rainforest? You have four major categories that classify biomes. Precipitation, temperature, plants, and animals. Sometimes you'll hear that as three. Climate, plants, and animals. And climate is precipitation and temperature. The major terrestrial biomes that I expect you to know are the ones that we've been researching in class and the ones listed here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them in this uh, presentation because you've been doing all that research in class. The aquatic biomes are your water biomes. Okay, You have freshwater aquatic biomes, the transitional water biomes, which is a mixture of, of fresh and salt, and then marine, which is saltwater biomes. Keep in mind, 
According to this diagram, about 97% of the Earth's water is salt water. Only 2.5-3% is fresh water. And of the fresh water, most of that is going to be glaciers or frozen water. So think about, you know, we need fresh water to survive, obviously. Think about how much is actually avail available to us as fresh water, fresh drinking water. Very, very little. We did a chart very similar to this in class. If you did not complete that chart, I've done the hard work for you here. So uh, pause on this if you need to and take that chart that you have in your unit packet and see if there's anything that you're missing. These are the, the terrestrial biomes that I expect you to know. All right, you are going to want to pause on this slide here so that you can answer, um, I think it's E, F, and G on your notes organizer. These are three diagrams that I am definitely going to expect you to be able to understand and analyze. So the question E says, which biome has an annual average precipitation of 150 centimeters, so we're looking right here, and 10 degrees Celsius, so that's going to put you smack dab in the middle of the temperate forest. Okay, use this one here to answer question F. What would you find closest to the equator? And use the climatograms here to make sure you understand how to read them. Uh, you might want to note this because it's kind of small on your paper. The line graph is the temperature. The bar graph is going to be the precipitation. And here's some example of freshwater biomes. Um, keep in mind that the water biomes are classified based on depth, sunlight, and um, temperature. And those sort of all go hand in hand, right? The shallower waters are going to get more sunlight, which means they're going to be warmer. The deeper zones are going to have um, less sunlight, which means they're going to be colder. So depending on the temperature of water is going to change what types of organisms can be supported. So you're going to find that both in your freshwater and marine biomes, your most biodiverse zones are going to be your shallow zones. And think about why that is. They're warmer because they have more sunlight, which means they can support more producers, which means they can support more consumers. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about ecosystem interactions and just some community ecology. So ecosystem terms you need to know are habitat and niche. A habitat is basically where an organism lives, an area of an ecosystem where an organism lives. A niche is the role that the organism plays in its environment. Okay, so this little bee here, part of his niche is to be a pollinator. His role is to be a pollinator. He lands on flowers, collects the pollen, and brings it to the next, uh, to the next flower when he's getting food. Okay, so remember, a community is a group of interacting populations, all of the living or biotic organisms in an area. Now, there are things that can affect the size of a biological community. Those are called limiting factors. So that's any biotic or abiotic factor that can restrict or control the size of a population. So that could be water, that could be sunlight, that could be food, that could be space, it could be predators, whatever. Anything that controls the size of a population. And those limiting factors are going to be what determines the carrying capacity um, so the maximum number of a population that an ecosystem can hold. So in our little graph here, we have a population of deer. So something, some limiting factors are controlling that population of deer. And if you look here, our carrying capacity is, uh, for this ecosystem for, of deer is somewhere around 80 size. Um, if when you go above that carrying capacity, you're going to see a decrease in the population because the ecosystem can't support it because of the limiting factors, and then it's going to fluctuate right there around the carrying capacity until something else happens, maybe some natural disaster or whatever. There are two types of limiting factors, so two things that can, can control the size of a population. You have density independent factors and density dependent factors. And just like the, the name says, density independent factors are factors that are independent of the size of a population. They do not depend on the size of a population. This would be like weather events, fires, air pollution, rainfall. It's not going to rain more if you have more animals. Right? It's not going to rain less if the population is small. It's, it's independent of the size of a population. Density dependent factors control the size of a population but are dependent on the size of a population. So disease, for example, is going to have a different impact depending on the size of a population. Uh, amount of predators or competition is going to depend on the size of a population. 
So then where do these biological communities come from? How do you form a biological community? Remember, biological community are all the living things. Well, there's a process called succession, ecological succession. This is where one biological community replaces another. This is the formation of a biological community. This is going to be a result of changing both biotic and abiotic factors. There are two types of biological uh, succession, or sorry, ecological succession. There's primary succession and there's secondary succession. And, and the difference is what you're starting with. So primary succession is gonna take place on newly exposed rock. There is no topsoil. Okay, so this is gonna happen usually following a volcanic eruption, but this could also happen if you have a glacier that melts or if you have a glacier that retreats. You're gonna have newly exposed rock. Very little organisms can grow on, new, on exposed rock. There, usually you need topsoil. So you have to begin with what's called a pioneer species. This is gonna be small things like lichens, mosses, and liverworts. They can grow on uh, newly exposed rock because they don't have true roots. So they can grow on the rock and then their little root system or root-like systems are going to break down those rocks in order to form a topsoil. And once that topsoil forms, then you can have bigger and bigger species come in. Okay, so the pioneer species comes in on the newly exposed rock in primary succession, starts to break it down, forms a topsoil so that you can now grow some herbs and some grasses. They're going to continue to break down that topsoil to form a richer and richer soil layer so that bigger things can grow. Grasses, shrubs, little trees, and then eventually you're going to have a nice rich soil layer and you can have a you know, community that has a wide variety of species there. Secondary succession is going to take place when you have a newly cleared area, but the topsoil remains. So this is going to happen after like a forest fire or a flood or um, a hurricane or a tornado or whatever. So this doesn't require pioneer species because you already have the topsoil layer remaining. So you're going to start by just having the smaller plants come in and form. Um, then you're going to have the return of your larger shrubs and your smaller trees, and then eventually your larger trees, and you're going to have a nice you know, mature forest. Okay, so continuing on with, with interactions within a community, you're now on the back side of your notes organizer. Um, you're going to have your shuns and your isms. Your shuns, and I'm talking about the way the words sound, are competition and predation. So competition is when one or more organism is trying to utilize the same resources. This does not mean fighting. Don't say that competition is fighting because trees compete for sunlight, but you're definitely not going to see you know, a tree out there punching another tree in order to take the sunlight away from it. So competition doesn't mean fight, it just means organisms trying to use the same resources. Predation is when you have one organism hunting and killing another. The organism doing the hunting is going to be the predator. The organism being hunted is going to be the prey. So in the case of our bird and worm interaction here, the bird would be the predator. The worm would obviously be the prey. Okay, now here are your isms. Your isms are the type of symbiotic relationships. Symbiosis is simply a long-term close relationship that exists between two or more different species living in an area. So just a relationship between two different species and there are three types. Draw these little symbols here next to the three types of symbiotic relationships. Draw two happy faces, happy faces for mutualism, draw a happy face and what I call a stale face for commensalism, and then a happy face and a sad face for parasitism. And this is gonna help you remember what these three types of symbiotic relationships are. So there are three isms, are types of symbiotic relationships. You have mutualism, two happy faces, where both species are benefiting from the relationship. This would be like oxpeckers eating pests off of zebras. The oxpeckers are obviously getting food, right? They're eating little insects, and the zebras are getting things that might carry disease off of their body that aren't gonna hurt them. So they're both benefiting, they're both happy face. Commensalism, happy face, stale face. This is when one species benefits, but the other one doesn't really care about the relationship. It's not benefiting from the relationship, it's not being harmed by the relationship, that is commensalism. So an example would be a bird, you know, building a nest in a tree. The bird obviously benefits because it has a place for its eggs to, you know, develop, but the tree doesn't care. The tree could care less whether or not a bird builds a nest in it. It's not harming it in any way. It's not hurting it in any way. That's commensalism. Parasitism, happy face, sad face. Parasitism is where one species is benefiting and the other species is being harmed by the relationship. So an example would be a tick living on a dog. 
The tick is obviously going to be getting blood and nutrients while the dog is having blood taken away, maybe even introducing disease. So that's gonna be harming the dog. So the thing that's benefiting from the relationship and parasitism, the happy face is gonna be the parasite, in this case, the tick. The thing that's being harmed by a parasitic relationship is called the host. In this case, the host is the dog. All right, now we're gonna talk about energy within an ecosystem. These are terms you should be familiar with, autotrophs and heterotrophs. You have two types of organisms in an in, in ecosystem. The autotrophs or producers, the organisms that are making their own food using energy from the sun or using chemicals, right? We've talked a lot about photosynthesis, those are your producers. And then your consumers, your heterotrophs, the organisms that depend on consuming other organisms in order to obtain their energy. Okay, the different types of heterotrophs or consumers are called herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, detrivores or scavengers, and then decomposers. You've probably heard most of these words before. Herbivores eat only plants, carnivores eat only animals. Omnivores eat, eat both plants and animals. Scavengers or detrivores are going to eat um, dead and decaying plants and animals. And then decomposers are going to break down that dead and decaying matter and then absorb the nutrients internally. So the difference there is scavengers, they eat it and then they digest it inside, internally. Decomposers break it down externally and then absorb the nutrients internally. So it's kind of opposite there. All right, food chains and food webs. You should be familiar with food chains and food webs. You probably talked a lot about that in seventh grade. So food webs and food chains model the flow of energy through an ecosystem. So the arrows in a food chain and food web aren't to show what eats what, they are to show the flow of energy. Each step in a food chain or a food web is known as a trophic level. Anytime you hear that word troph, it's implying um, sort of like food or energy level. Okay, so the different trophic levels, the first level are going to be your producers, the second level are going to be your primary consumers or herbivores, the third level is going to be your secondary consumers, which is kind of consuming, usually your omnivores or small carnivores. And then as you go on there, you're getting into your um, higher and higher level carnivores. So tertiary consumers and then quaternary consumers. So let's start by talking about food webs. Food webs are models that represent the interconnected food chains and pathways where energy flows in an ecosystem. So it shows all of the feeding relationships within a particular ecosystem. And within that food web, there are individual food chains. So for example, here's our food web. A food chain within this food web would be like the salt marsh plants, the grasses, that's our producer. The primary consumer would be our insects. This is a food chain within our food web. Then our secondary consumer would be our rat, our tertiary consumer would be our snake, and then our quaternary consumer would be our hawk. That is a food chain within this food web. Okay, so again, a food chain is the simple model that shows a linear flow of energy. This Energy flows from this to this to this to this within an ecosystem. And then the food web shows all of those food chains, all of those feeding relationships. As you go from one trophic level to the next in a food web, you're actually losing energy. And it's not just a little bit of energy, it's a lot of energy. 90% of energy is lost as you travel from one trophic level to the next. So you have the most energy available to producers, which makes sense, right? They get their energy from the sun, there's lots of sun energy available. So you have your largest biomass um, at the bottom level, at the producer level. And then as you go through the food web or food chain, you're losing available energy. So only 10% of energy is retained from one level to the next. So the top carnivores have very little energy available to them which makes sense when you think about an ecosystem. You have a lot more producers. You have a lot more grass and plants and uh, phytoplankton and algae and all that stuff. You have a lot more of that than you do those top predators. You have very few lions in a grassland ecosystem. You have very few uh, sharks or killer whales. When you compare that to the number of producers or even primary consumers. And the reason for that is because there's less energy available to them. So energy pyramids illustrate that, that loss of energy there. Okay, so here's an energy pyramid. I've given you a unit down here, 1,000 kilo, kilo, kilo calorie units of energy. Um, for a bonus, I want you to, on a scrap sheet of paper, take that information that you just learned about in energy pyramids, and I want you to tell me how many units of energy, how many kilocalories of energy would be, be available to these little prairie dogs here, and then how many 
kilocalorie units of energy would be available to these wolves here. So remember, 90% of energy is lost, 10% of energy is retained. So write that on a little scratch sheet of paper with your name, and you can turn that in as a bonus for your very first grade that you get this semester. Hope you're having a great day. Take care.